So today we're going to talk about the very sexy topic of monitoring, which is something a couple years ago that I think I would have said ironically. Now I said slightly less ironically. Um, cool. So I'm Ian. I'm a senior engineer at Container Solutions, and I'm here with Friso from Fashion Trade. So he's going to give a bit of a spiel about uh, what Fashion Trade is, the platform, the architecture, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then I'm going to come back in and talk about monitoring in general, a brief whirlwind history of, of monitoring, um, some things to consider about when you're looking for a monitoring solutions, specifically on top of Kubernetes, and about what we did to go through this specific uh, challenge and what we implemented. So with that, I'll leave it to Chris straight away. Cool. Okay. Yeah, sure. Love to thing. Um, and I have my, my slicing area. Yeah, they are they're all uh, fabulous. Uh, fashion trade. So um, I'm I'm actually really here just to give you a little heads up on you know fashion trade and what is it, what do we do, and um, why do we have all this stuff in the first place. So fashion trade is a business to business uh, e-commerce platform. Um, we connect fashion brands and retailers so they can do business, and uh, as such. Um, it's uh, you know something that looks a lot like the e-commerce. Does the clicky thing still click? Yeah, it does. That's uh, lag probably now. Um, so it is e-commerce, um, and then uh, um, we set out to build this thing uh, starting um, somewhere mid previous year. Um, all of the development so far basically has been done in the past eight months, eight to nine months. Um, um, as a result, we had the interesting opportunity to come up with um, our complete new stack in a greenfield solution. And um, there, it was uh, so decided that we were going to do... <laughs> come on. <laughs> I don't want to do the click thing anymore, Ian. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, we would do uh, microservices uh, because uh, we've had monoliths at the office and uh, it was a disaster. Um, first of all, nobody really enjoyed it. Uh, and also you have to uh, understand that when you look at the monolith right here, it doesn't look that um, horrible, but this is like a really large bottle. Uh, it's not just a regular sized beer. Um, so um, it's problematic. It's too large to digest. Um, it's also hard to scale organizationally because if you have like two of those really large bottles of beer, then uh, you know you never get to this uh, point where everybody has just enough. So you always have this excess capacity there. And um, more problematically, uh, it doesn't really work if people have different flavors. Other than that, it's just really not a great beer. <coughs> so. Microservices. We are living a microservices life, and that means um, for us primarily, and that's also the, the primary goal uh, uh, for us at this point, that we, we want to, to achieve some organizational scalability. Um, because we're, we're growing pretty quickly, and um, whenever uh, you know somebody joins, we want that person to be able to uh, go up to uh, productivity pretty quickly. Um, as a result, and we still kept this record, is that anybody who joins the team has written production software in the first two days. Um, I, I don't see uh, us breaking that promise anytime soon. This is the number of times we uh, actually push something to production per uh, week. Um, so that's on a team of, uh, let's say, 10 people uh, actually doing uh, stuff or growing to 10 people. Um, <coughs> So somebody pushes something to production only about four times a day um, without uh, much hassle. Um, and here's how that works and what it all looks like at Fashion Spray. Uh, we, we have our incoming traffic. Uh, we're on Google Cloud, by the way. Um, SSL is offloaded at Google's load balancer. We have our own API gateway internally, uh, which is also deployed as a service uh, on our Kubernetes clusters, which is uh, just as with um, Kubernetes interesting talk on Google Container Engine. And there we have all our platform services that get deployed um, through um, a couple of custom things that we, um, we did. Um, 
the um, unit of deployment is uh, a buffer container and, uh, that obviously within Kubernetes goes to become a pod uh, or goes in a pod, which is then part of a deployment that has a service on top of it. Uh, the cool thing about the way that works for us is that we've abstracted away pretty much all of that to um, uh, general development team uh, by means of a setup that uses metadata as part of the Docker file that allows you uh, to describe what that deployment of that particular service uh, should look like. Um, so here you see this for one particular server, it has uh, an ID, it's a service, it has a number of ports, and most importantly it has some, some routing information that tells you, you know, where should this thing live in terms of the DNS prefix of the domain where it is and maybe also the path uh, prefix where you can reach that thing from the outside. And that routing information obviously is important. Uh, for our API gateway that actually makes sure that traffic for that particular service goes there. Um, and then when uh, you um, have a repository that has such a Docker file in there and you uh, merge whatever changes you made to master, uh, deployment will happen. Uh, first to build and then later on deployment. And as part of that deployment, there is a custom pipeline uh, on Jenkins that will do the build, it will do the actual deploy, meaning it uses that metadata in the Docker file to generate the Kubernetes manifest, the YAML files, and applies that against uh, the target cluster, which could be development or production or some other environment. Um, and as a result of that deployment, our API gateway will actually update its routing state at runtime to make sure that um, the, uh, the API routing matches whatever is deployed at that point. And then, uh, obviously, Kubernetes will scale things as required. And um, finally, all of that also magically somehow gets monitored. And that's actually what this talk is about. Because why do we monitor? Do you want the clicker thing? I'm going to try it. I don't trust it. That's right. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so this all fancy architecture that we have, microservices and orchestration and containers and everything, um, led us to this project where we needed some kind of monitoring solution uh, as we're kind of heading toward the official go live of the product. Um, so a good thing to start when you start a new project is to look at why you're doing this, right? So why do we actually monitor things in general? Um, and I think there's a few reasons that we can look at of why we want to monitor and maybe some basic benefits we want to get out of this. I trusted you, Clicker, and you let me down. You didn't, you're there. So one of the main things that we generally think about is we want to know about problems in our system before our actual end users, right? So in our case, if all of a sudden Biancorf gives us a call and says, I'm trying to place an order for these clothes and it's not working. So now we're already in a state that's really, really bad for us, right? We're losing money, we're uh, losing face, uh, and now some developers are gonna have to go and run around and figure out what's going on. They're under stress, they're under pressure. Uh, if there's an issue on our platform or potential issue, we wanna know about this a lot longer, or a lot earlier than our customers actually find out. So this is kind of the big main reason. Uh, the second reason is for easier debugging. So if we do have issues on our, problem, on our platform, or you know, we just see potential weirdness going on, if we have monitoring set up, then we have a lot better idea of how, sorry, where to look and how to start trying to figure this out. So we can see you know, maybe which part of the platform or which service is actually starting this, uh, which time did this error start occurring. It makes our a life a lot easier when we go to, to start debugging. But it's not all about you know, mitigating and, and solving failures, right? We also can get a lot of insight into our platform and into our systems. So if, when we have monitoring set up, we can see you know, how many API calls of each, uh, of each API is actually being called, um, which pieces of our website are actually getting used. And this is interesting from the technology side because now we know which pieces of our system, which services are really getting used, so where should we focus our actual effort? We don't want to waste time on a piece of our system that's not even getting executed. And also, from a business perspective, we can learn a whole lot about our system, right? How people are actually using it, and this is really, really valuable for us. 
And this leads kind of into the final point, is that monitoring enables us to a lot of real, do a lot of really cool stuff within our platform. So if you think about stuff like A-B testing and canary releases, right? You can't do this if you don't have a proper monitoring system in place. You can have two different versions of a feature that you want to try and roll out, but how do you know which one works or which one's actually getting used unless you have proper monitoring? Uh, and all this data you're collecting can also feed into different kinds of automation. Um, you can do cool stuff with machine learning once you have this platform in place. So we'll just take a really very brief history uh, through monitoring. So way, way back, we had the time uh, of before monitoring where we didn't really have monitoring systems in place. So then we're kind of in this system of reactive ops where we're just running around putting out fires if, if an issue actually comes up. So somebody's logging into an actual terminal and just starting to debug right away. So this is not really a place we want to be in. So as we move on, we've got kind of these classic monolithic architectures that we now like to make fun of a lot. And we have this more basic binary monitoring, right? So, you know, is my system alive or dead? I like to refer to this as poke it with a stick monitoring. And this is obviously not ideal, but we're getting a little better, right? At least we have some kind of idea of the state of our system. So as we move along and the architecture progresses, we have, you know, the client, classic client server architectures. And around this time we had, um, SNMP, which, uh, which came out, so Simple Network Management um, Protocol. Now this was, if you've worked with this at all, it's not actually that simple, um, but it was a step forward again, because this was the first time that we're you know, trying to standardize things, we're trying to come up with a protocol. So again, it's still a step forward. And as we move forward a little bit more, we see these classic kind of multi-tier architectures, so the three-tier architecture and such. Um, and then we start monitoring all the different components within our system. But it's mostly still around black box monitoring. So I'm gonna monitor all the pieces, but it's still just this, a view from the outside. So is it alive? Am I getting a 200 okay from this specific service? Moving on a bit further, we saw stuff like JMX, which allows us to actually get some insight into our application itself. We can actually see some internal metrics, also allowed us to start customizing a bit the kind of metrics that we're exposing. So then we move on to microservices coming around, and then we've seen this huge proliferation of these APM tooling, so application performance monitoring. And this is fed by or fed into, depending on which way you want to look at it, the whole big data craze, right? I want to collect all this information I can possibly from my system and my applications, and we'll put it into the big data, and then money will come from somewhere. So one thing we see is that kind of monitoring has always lagged a bit behind the technology, right? The technology comes first, and then monitoring kind of comes along afterwards. So now we're kind of still doing microservices, but we're in this cloud-native world. So we see this trend of more and more pieces um, becoming more and more of a challenge for monitoring, right? We have now a bunch of different systems and applications running in Docker containers that are distributed across a bunch of different hosts across different regions and we have to monitor all these different pieces. And they're all ephemeral, and they're dynamic, and they're distributed. So if my application dies over here on this host, it might automatically get rescheduled way over here. And I see, somehow need to know about all this without having you know, fixed IPs or anything like that. And this idea of, of your service or replication is just kind of this uh, not tangible thing, right? There's a lot of different pieces that compose what, what your service actually is, but you know, I care about the health of my service. So this becomes pretty complex. Um, and we see that monitoring has become really essential. It's not an optional thing anymore. Uh, if you don't have monitoring set up and you're running you know, a cloud-native orchestrated application, then you're actually paying a lot, more, uh, a lot more pain than you're actually getting from the benefits. So it's the Kubernetes uh, theme meetup. So, and Elmer alluded to this a little bit earlier in his talk, where Kubernetes kind of solves some of these problems for us, right? It does, it automates all of these operations tasks. So if my system dies, it should just get restarted, right? I should be able to do auto scaling. So doesn't this kind of solve some of our problems? Well, it solves some of them, but 
Kubernetes or whatever orchestration layer you're using is another level of complexity. So it's another level where you can have issues, where you have to do debugging. And also all of this automation, it requires some, it requires monitoring, it requires data to feed into it. So coming back to, to Fashion Trade um, and the issues or the, the challenge that we were trying to solve. So as Friso mentioned, we're running on Google Container Engine and we're heading towards this production launch or this go live and we need a proper monitoring solution. Now Stackdriver is kind of the, the default that you get when you're running on GKE, which is both logging and a monitoring solution. So we had this kind of set up initially as you know this was kind of what was available but we weren't really that satisfied. Uh, it was actually an acquisition by Google, not sure how long ago, and they still seem to be trying to fit it together. Um, and there were some holes in it from what we could see. It didn't really have this concept of um, this Kubernetes landscape, so it didn't really understand pods. Um, so we decided to look elsewhere for something a little bit different. And you know, we want to monitor all of our pieces. We want to monitor our applications, our services, our orchestration layer, the containers, all this stuff, and we want it fairly centralized. So if you start looking around for monitoring tools, there's quite a lot available. And in searching, I actually found a site that had an article of the top 50 monitoring tools available, which seems to imply there's a lot more than 50. Um, but I'm a developer, and I like to play with the newest and coolest stuff. So when this came up, I said, we're going to use Prometheus because it's awesome. Um, and it's the cloud native solution, by which I mean it was adopted by the CNCF, or the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, and it plays with Kubernetes really nicely. It has a similar background. Uh, so Prometheus was actually developed by ex Googlers, uh, mostly at SoundCloud. It was based on Kubernetes, or sorry, Google's internal monitoring solution, uh, Borgmon and built by these guys at SoundCloud and then open source and now it's this fully open source tool. And it's very powerful, it's very customizable and it has a really good community around it. There's a lot of integrations built, uh, a lot of adoption, so I was pretty excited to, to use this. But it turns out that uh, excitement of developers is not necessarily what the product team is going to base their decision on. So then it came around to a bit of a discussion about, okay, what what really makes sense. You know, the classic buy versus build discussion that we have. Uh, so build here being, you know, build and set up our own internal Prometheus setup versus looking at one of these SaaS providers that we saw in the earlier slide. So if you start looking at the, the real pros and cons on each side, um, it does really depend on your actual setup, your needs, and that kind of thing. So, you know, if we go with one of these existing SaaS solutions, you know, we save a lot of time because this is already up and running. Uh, this shifts the responsibility of running this thing because if there's some other company doing it, it's, it's existing. Negative. Sorry? Sorry, it can also be negative. Yes, this is true. A lot is a debatable. Um, it is another external dependency. So, you know, you're kind of dependent on this, this third party. You know, if they change something, if they jack up the price, you're kind of tied to it a little bit. So if you look at building your own solution, you know, you get a lot more customizable, and it's a lot more fun from a developer's perspective. The saving money is kind of arguable. I mean, you're saving money by, that you're not spending, but you're spending it on developer's hours, which can be a lot more expensive. And it's more pieces to manage. So I think this is something that you need to weigh in in every case, like what's the best fit for you uh, or the company. And as I mentioned before, we were really heading towards this, this go launch, this go live of the product. Uh, we didn't really have the resources to spend on building and maintaining our own solution. So we opted to, uh, to try out one of the SaaS products. So uh, and we also didn't want to do a bunch of POCs right, on 10 different products. So we did a quick check checklist of what we really wanted. So we wanted something that would set up quickly. You know, I mean, within a day, we can have this monitoring solution. Uh, at least starting to collect some of our data. We want it to integrate easily with the pieces we already have. So we've got Kubernetes, we have Kafka, we have Elasticsearch. You know, we want that support out of the box. And also JMX, or specifically Drop Wizard, uh, if possible, because the majority of our services were written on top of that. And we obviously don't want to spend a lot of money. 
So the decision process was pretty quick. We looked for which solution would give us these checks, the check the boxes, and we opted to try out Datadog. This is the best. Um, what happens if one goes forward and one goes back? Oh. Open it. Wormhole. Um, so we decided we'd give, we'd give Datadog a try. There was, we had some recommendations as well. Um, see if this would solve our problems. Uh, and so this is the architecture that we had set up with our, uh, within our systems. So the way that works is that there is a, um, it's a SaaS product. You can send your data either th directly through their API, or you can run one of their agents on your on your own hosts and just push data to the agents over UDP. Kind of a standard StatsD interface. So again, we're running on Kubernetes, and we want to be able to monitor all of our systems. So daemon sets, uh, as Adam mentioned earlier, is a good way to solve this because I want to know that I have one agent running on every node. And we have auto scaling, so if, if we scale up and add another node, I don't want to have to go manually deploy another agent. I just want that to happen. So, so daemon sets is a really nice way to, to solve that. So we create a daemon set which deploys this agent to, to all of our nodes, and then we put a service on top of that so that all of our internal services can just interact with that. They don't need to know where it's running. It says just send this data to uh, the Datadog hostname, and it'll find it into one of those. <coughs> Um, so up here also, you actually have CV. We're running some systems externally to Kubernetes, so specifically Kafka and Elasticsearch. Uh, so there we just, through Ansible, we also just install an agent on one of these nodes. So these agents will collect all of the data that they receive. They also pull stuff from, um, from the host themselves and send that all into this one platform so we have all our data in one spot. And this was a pretty quick setup. Oh yeah, I was promised this was the initial draft version of our architecture, which didn't get accepted. I wanted to submit a PR to Datadog that this be their formal icon for the Datadog agent. I'm still waiting to hear back. Um, but yeah, so we got this set up and we got these pretty colorful dashboards of what our, our system looked like. Um, I think within the first day, I had this stuff deployed and had this data available, which makes um, product managers really happy. So in that sense, it was, it was pretty successful. Uh, one slightly side note is that when you look at monitoring, this seems to be for some reason a contentious debate, whether you're pushing or pulling metrics. Uh, and so for our solution, we're essentially doing, uh, for the most part, push-based system. So we thought we'd talk a little bit about why we went that way um, and what are the things to consider if you're gonna go for a push-based system or a pull-based, which is uh, something like Prometheus. Um, one of the common arguments around pull is that it doesn't really scale. Although I think this is based more on kind of older setups and systems. I think now if you're running any modern system, even pull is going to scale just fine. Um, instrumentation is a factor. So, you know, if I'm running a push system, this means all of my services need to uh, need to send data somewhere. Um, in our case, this was solved pretty easily. We found a library that just collected the actual uh, droppers and metrics and pushed them directly to, uh, to Datadog to StatsD. So we didn't have to do any actual instrumentation in the code. Uh, but this is something to consider. Um, so target discovery. Now if I have a, a push-based system again, uh, all of my different services, all of my pieces need somehow to find the actual monitoring sol solution or the, the collector. They have to know where to actually send the data. Now again, we mitigated this by, uh, by a Kubernetes setup because they're just sending data through by UDP to the Datadog hostname, and where that seems to find it, uh, that finds its way to the agent wherever it is. Um, another potential issue is uh, if I have a, a pull-based system, that means my monitoring solution is going to actually reach out and talk to all of my different services, and this way I can find out if the service actually dies. I'm going to get a different response than if maybe it's too slow to respond or it's busy. But if I'm doing push-based, then how's the, how's the monitoring system supposed to know if my, if my service is dead or if it's just slow? So this can be a concern when you're doing push-based, but since we have the Kubernetes layer on top, 
And this isn't really a moot point for us because Kubernetes already takes care of uh, if our systems are dead. And it just restarts them. But in the end, you can kind of do both.